On today's show, we're talking about topics from money to entrepreneurship. And watch to the end to get tips for improving your home studio. Welcome to the Inspired Money Podcast, where we explore positive money stories. I'm Andy, host and financial advisor at Runnymede Capital Management. If you want to improve your perspectives on money and use your money for good to make a bigger impact, subscribe right now and hit that bell to get notifications of future videos. You'll get interviews and money tips. Today, I get to introduce you to my friend Junaid. Junaid is host of the Hacks and Hobbies podcast. He's a user experience designer and founder of Humble Zone, a creative agency offering design services to small businesses. Junaid is a lot of things. He's also a beekeeper, cyclist, and filmmaker. In today's world of remote work and virtual meetings, Junaid has designed an extraordinary home studio. He helps people to improve their home setups, including yours truly. He gave me advice so my work from home setup shines, whether I'm on a Zoom call or having an appearance on financial TV. In this episode, you'll learn money perspectives from an entrepreneur who was born in Pakistan, grew up in Saudi Arabia, and came to the United States. How to balance work, hobbies, family, and more. And you'll get tips for upgrading your home studio for better virtual calls and videos. Now let's get inspired with Junaid Ahmed. Junaid, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. And it's thank you so much for having me on the Inspired Money podcast. I'm super excited. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? Holy smokes, man. That is a very good question. So this was this was way back in the days we we were hanging out or we were <clears throat> with my parents we were at a store buying some shoes and I really like these Nikes these are and then they're 250 rials so I was in Saudi Arabia and these shoes look really nice and my dad's like no that's too expensive I'm, I'm I don't want to spend more than 200 rials and I was like oh I have 50 rials that <laughs> you can use. Now, granted, right, this is money that my dad gave me. And it's like, you don't understand money. I'm like, no, I don't. So that's my earliest recollection of money. Now, I'll, I also remember another incident where it was Eid and um, we all got these gifts. We got dollar gifts, you know, uh, during Eid time, uh, the one after Ramadan, you give kids, you know, a dollar, two dollar, five dollars, ten dollar a gift as a present so they can buy gifts and whatnot. So I was given maybe a $10 or $5 bill or maybe a $2 bill. And my uncle was like, Hey, if you give me that $2 bill, I'll give you this camera. And it was like a film camera. I'm like, okay, that's not a bad deal. So those were my two little memories around money and, and how money is used to, you know, make changes. So you had good taste in sneakers, and this was the early beginning of your interest in cameras, which yes. you still have. That's it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so you lived in Saudi Arabia. Where were you born? And then when did you come to the United States? Absolutely. So I was born in Karachi, Pakistan, um, long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Just kidding. Um, in a country far, far away, you know, Karachi, Pakistan, was where I, where I was born. Then I grew up in Saudi Arabia um, for most of my elementary and, and high school. And when I finished my high school, I came out to the United States in around 95. So basically after high school, I came to the U.S. Okay, so I'm, I'm curious, like, how were all these three places similar and different from one another? That's a good question. Um, the, the way they could be similar is that I've, you know, I've, I've had family in, in all three countries. And what happened in the 80s is that my mom's siblings, they all moved out to California and instead of, and then we moved to Saudi Arabia. So there's a ton of family in both locations. Now in Saudi Arabia, we didn't have a lot of family. My dad moved out there because he had an excellent opportunity. He had 
just learned, you know, programming and he was doing programming. And um, so, you know, he had an excellent opportunity to move out to the US, sorry, move out to the to KSA or Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And what was really similar between the two locations is, is the connections or the friends that I eventually made. And now I'm living in, you know, Virginia, which is again, you know, my third move or third state that I've lived in the U.S. for a long time. What were the others? So I lived in Colorado, California, Colorado, and now Virginia. Hmm. They are all different. <laughs> Very different. So I'm wondering, being born in Pakistan, being in the, like the Middle East, being in the U.S., any different attitudes when it comes to money? You know, that's an excellent question. The reason, now I, I learned about money very late in the game and which is really interesting because in the U.S., so when I first moved out here, I was 19. Now, I wasn't, I was told by my my parents, my father, you know, you need to save money because in the end you can use it when you need to make big purchases. But I was never a saver. Like even now I suck at it, but I'm, I'm trying to get better, <laughs> trying to get better at it. Um, but in the US, when I moved out, my uncle said, hey, you need to get a job. Like, why do I need to get a job? I'm going to college. So then when I'm done with college, I can have a really nice job, blah, blah, blah. So my concept around money was very isolated because uh, we grew up in a single income household where only my, my dad worked and you know my mom was housewife. I mean, we were seven siblings uh, after all. We were five siblings for the longest time. And towards the end, before I moved out here, we were you know seven siblings. So my mom took care of them, of us, so it was an interesting, right? So my, my dad had good money management skills, which I wish were passed down to me, but you know, there's always that, there's always a black sheep. <laughs> I feel like I might be one of those. So you say that the money management came to you late. How and when did that come to you how did that happen right so when i moved out to the u.s um after finishing college i was so i started going to college and my dad was paying for the college you know from overseas as well as um he was also paying rent for me living with my aunt at the time but then i was told that hey you need to work so that you can pay for your uh you know expenses blah 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 and I was like, no, no, I'm not going to work. I'm going to just go to college and, you know, do that college route. But since I didn't grow up in the U.S., because when you're growing up in the U.S., people uh, start working as young as, you know, 13, 10, 13 years old, because, you know, they have paper routes where they're doing lawn mowing, stuff like that. I didn't learn any of that. I was like, okay. So it was around... When I started working, I was I was said, okay, I was told, okay, you're now working, you need to pay rent in this house, right? You, you're, you're taking a room, you're using all of this stuff. So it was really interesting. And around some point, I was introduced to the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it reminded me, it reminded me a lot of the things that I was taught, you know, the, the dad who's the who's a professor versus the dad who's a businessman. And it just so happened that our neighbor in Saudi Arabia, uh, across the street, across the, the hallway, we lived in an apartment complex. He owned a business and I would tell my dad, dad, we need to own a business of some sort. And my dad was like, you know, you don't have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> He's absolutely right. Because running a business is no joke, <laughs> no joke at all. So I think, I don't know if I answered your question 100%, but that was my experience, you know, around money and around really understanding what it means to have 
financial well-being or you know health financial health even okay so rich dad poor dad influenced you and it sounds like you kind of followed your dad's footsteps since you mentioned that he was doing programming you are in tech i know that you have a passion for user interface and design mm -hmm. did you follow his path kind of i've kind of followed his path i mean he he did his bachelor's as a b commerce or you know into into commerce so he was working at a bank uh, after he graduated and if you don't know the story, but the very first programmers, they were hired out from banks. And so they had some program going on where IBM was, was looking for professionals like, hey, we're teaching how to do programming. Who wants who wants in? So my dad, you know, he raised his hand and he got into that programming space and he was a system analyst for a long time. So when I came, uh, when I when we had our first computer in 92, I watched him type away on that keyboard without even looking at the keyboard and, you know, me being a teenager and I'm like, holy smokes, how are you able to do that? Right. So I totally got into the tech space through that channel because we owned a computer because what's funny is that even though we had computers at our school, uh, I took the computer uh, science um, line of education and we had a computer lab and there was computers but I was never the one sitting at the computer. I was always like sitting behind or, you know, watching others use a computer. It might've been be because uh, there's a totally different uh, tangent on, you know, why that might be. But um, when, I, when, when we finally owned the computer is when I was really more interested. And uh, I guess it's, it, you call it the, the, um, the science of, of, uh, in, there's a word there, there's, it's like the girl, it's a girl next door. You get infatuated to the thing that are close to you. Right. So I think that's, that's what eventually ended up, ended up happening. Well, it may not have been identical, but I did see that you worked at FINRA, the financial industry regulatory authority and the world bank treasury. So <laughs> It sounds similar. It does. It does sound similar. I, I, I rounded back up to where he started. <laughs> <laughs> but then with Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you do aspire to have like side businesses or some element of entrepreneurship aside from your quote unquote day job. Absolutely. And I think that's mainly because it's in my blood to be an entrepreneur. So when I came out to the US, I, I saw that my uncle, so my, my mom's uh, one of nine siblings, so five of my uncles, each one of them had a different business that they were doing. One of my uncles had an import export business. Another uncle was buying and selling cars, although he hadn't started that way. And then he was old. So everybody, you know, had different ways that they use their mind on entrepreneurship and when i i didn't pay much attention to it and then i as i get into like tech and it got into the different hobbies that i was into it just inspired me more and more and the people that i connected to were also entrepreneurs you know either they're running a small web hosting shop or they're running a computer shop where you know there's just one person and then you're there as somebody that's assembling computers and then the other people that i worked with were also entrepreneurs or freelancers. It wasn't till 2007 or 2008 that I actually worked at a corporate job per se. And then I, I was looking back and realizing of all of these things. And I realized that my mom's dad owned a trade shop back in Pakistan. And people would come and buy, you know, buy goods and stuff like that. And I was like, that is interesting. So it's like, technically it's in my blood to be an entrepreneur, to go out and seek people and seek, you know, these different experiences. So, so that was really fascinating to learn about myself. Fascinated by your hobbies, 
first, you have a podcast called Hacks and Hobbies, and we're friends. So I, I think I only know like scratching the surface of your hobbies, but I know that you did beekeeping, you're into cycling, you do podcasting, you're into cameras, photography, and videos. How do you balance hobbies, family, work, and possible entrepreneurial pursuits? Well, that's an excellent question, my friend. And what's really interesting and what I've, what I found that worked for me was that you've got to take everything in moderation. And even though I might have, you know, um, real passion about one thing or another, I'll give it the time of day. I'll give it a week or two weeks or three weeks. Just really delve really, really deep into it. And, you know, now I am, now I know that knowledge and I can, you know, use it as reference whenever having, I'm having a conversation around those topics. So over the years, I've been, you know, fascinated about computers, fascinated, you know, I, when I first came out here, I opened up a computer and I put it back together. I'm like, oh, this is how everything works. And I, I was just really into that. And then cycling was something that I recently got back into in 2017 or 2016, because I was a cyclist back in Saudi Arabia as well. I've owned several bike, bikes and I would, you know, bike around, bike around town, go to my friend's house, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that was, that's where cycling comes into. Now, beekeeping was a really interesting one. And I didn't know if I were ever going to be a beekeeper. And that was brought to my attention when in 2012, we went to see uh, an allergist for my son. My son has allergies and seasonal allergies, yeah. as food allergies. And the doctor said, hey, local honey would be really good for seasonal allergies. I'm like, well, where do you get, how do you get local? Yeah. Not even a thing, right? So he's, and then he didn't mention anything, but it was still in the back of my mind. In 2014, um, a friend of mine in Colorado was setting up a farm, a 10 acre farm. And he said, hey, can I borrow your GoPro camera? I'm getting, I'm gonna be getting uh, a few beehives for my farm. I'm like, that's really interesting. Why do you need beehives? Like, oh, so they can come and pollinate my, my, my plants and whatnot. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. So I, I lent him the camera, he recorded the video, you know, he came back to me. So, the, you know, like I'm just following these breadcrumbs on honey, honey and beekeeping and local farmers and whatnot. And then since I'm also a huge Kickstarter backer, over 260 projects on Kickstarter, I ran into this project called Honey Flow or Flow Hive, which created a hive in which you just stick a jar in front of this faucet and turn the, turn the lever and you got honey coming out of the hive. I'm like, what? What can be even more easier than that? So that what got me into beekeeping. And finally, when in 2017, we owned a home and we had the space, I was like, okay, let's go learn more about it. And, and I found some local, uh, local beekeepers, you know, joined up with the teams uh, with the groups over there and, you know, learn about beekeeping. So how do I find time for each one of them? So different seasons, I look, you know, for different seasons need different times. So for example, in springtime, the beehives are buzzing and they need a lot of room to grow. They need a lot of, uh, you know, they just need a lot of tending so they can continue to grow and bring the honey in. And then also uh, around springtime or between summertime, I'm spending a lot more time cycling. Like right now that we have winter, there's a lot of training happening. So I spend time on those. So I take the time out, set up time blocks. Okay, this time I'm working on this one, this time I'm working on this one. And sure, there are a lot of projects that are still waiting to be finished, right? Because um, when you have three kids, and a family, you know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of hard. You can say that again. I know. 
<laughs> Absolutely. So I want to talk about cameras in home studios because you are the biggest influence on why my camera looks the way it does. Most of the listeners today are going to be audio only, so they can't see this. They're going to have to go to YouTube to watch this so they can see what we're talking about. Yeah. But thanks to you, every time that I go on a Zoom call or I have some kind of web conference, I'm getting compliments on my image. So thank you, Junaid. Absolutely. <laughs> Happy to do it. And I'm wondering if I can switch over to my Logitech on the fly here, you just should. to see what it looks like. Yo, uh, drop down. Let's see if I break anything. Oh, you know what? No, it is plugged in. I don't know why it's, oh, hold on. Huh, okay. Oh, here we go. I was picking the wrong thing. So this is my so this is the webcam. Logitech web webcam. Why is it that people shouldn't just use their laptop camera or their phone camera or a Logitech, which the Logitechs are pretty nice, but you can definitely see a difference between this image and the one I get from using my Canon DSLR. Now, the awesome thing that you've done with your setup, right? So you've got the lighting set up perfectly. You've got the ex the extra lights in the back that adds some more uh, personality and more separation from the talent and the background. So even when you switched over to the webcam, your image looked pristine. The only difference was everything was in focus. Now only you are in focus. Yeah, they can see the mess on my back shelf. <laughs> yeah. And that's why you don't see the mess on my shelf because that shelf is really messy. <laughs> so this is kind of a potential side hustle for you because your image, I mean, I get excited because I get compliments on my camera, yeah. but you've been receiving that for some time now. I have, I definitely have. I haven't jumped on as much Zoom calls as I would like to, but yeah, I've, I've Definitely received a ton of compliments and especially if you go to a room where, so here's the difference, right? So now I'm part of some other groups on Facebook that are the same, that, that are outputting the same quality that I am, right? So they're at the same level as I am. So I will, I will not get a compliment from them. Sure, every once in a while, they're like, okay, your image is sharp. You got good color coordination going on and, you know, clothing coordination going on. So I'll get those things, but they know what I'm doing. But anytime that I go in a room when where they haven't seen an image like this before, or if I'm on a one-on-one -on -one call, they're like, what are you doing? How are you getting this clean HD? And why are you switching camera angles? Like, am I tuning into a home studio, right? So, so it's really good to hear because I did spend around six months in perfecting the lighting, the the image, the the layout of the room, put a lot of time into it. You mentioned spending, and I'm curious, like the hobbies and the spending, how did that work? Because I kind of feel like you don't have a fear of spending for things that you're passionate about. That is very true. I don't have a fear of spending, but I am conscious on when I do, like I will do a ton of research and I will, I will go and look for the bargain deals. Like for example, just earlier, I had this delivered. Um, so this is a basically a clamp that goes onto a pole over here. And then you can attach a camera or a light or a microphone on this end. Now, you can spend about $34 for something like this or $13. So I do make sure that I, I find the right stuff that I'm saving, even though I'm getting that same result that somebody who'd spend $100 or $200. And how much do you think someone should budget for upgrading 
their home studio to get a better camera, to get some lighting, to even do a little bit of rearranging of the, I guess, what's behind them yeah, so that it looks good. So what I'd recommend and what, what I always tell everybody is think of setting up your studio or your camera setup as an investment, right? So when we buy our homes and we all own, all own homes, we spend a considerable amount of time and effort and research into what comes in our living room, what comes in our family room, like those sofas. Do we need a recliner sofa in our family room so we can you know, relax and watch TV? Absolutely. How much money are you going to spend on it? Maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand dollars, right? Depending on your budget, depending on how long you're going to be able to use those furnitures. Like when we were talking initially, and I was telling you, hey, you just need a Canon camera, and you can go get that look. And you're like, oh, I have this one from seven years ago. Now, Very true. Seven years, right? So even if you spend fifteen hundred dollars on a camera seven years ago you're still able to use it today. So it is definitely an investment. The camera that I bought um, almost seven, eight years ago was around the same. I spent probably $1,500 to $1,800 on it. And now my kids use it, but you know, it's still a camera that you can use. So think of it, of, as, of it as an investment. It's a one-time thing. So I've, I've worked on several different packages or, or price points that could work for somebody anywhere from you know $2,500 as a beginning point which will not only get your camera but it's all also able to get you additional things like a teleprompter the way the reason I'm able to look directly at you and also in the camera is because I'm using a teleprompter right here which let me lets me see directly through the image and the camera at the same time that's so the, the have, next upgrade that I want to <laughs> that I want to exactly. emulate. So, so again, you know, if you you can start anywhere from you know five hundred dollars to thousand dollars to all the way up to fifteen thousand dollars. Again, what are you trying to achieve? Are you you know are you creating content on the fly? Or are you just on the Zoom calls all day long? You want to look best. Here's the other thing that I found, and you probably mentioned it the other day. There's something called a there's something called Zoom dysmorphia, right? It's caused Americans in the US last year to spend a ridiculous amount in plastic surgery. Because guess what's happening when you're in front of a camera or in front of your own image? You start, you start picking out your face and you're like, okay, um, I forgot to shave this part or you know, I, I need to put some eyeshadow here. You know, You start looking at yourself now, a cool thing is if you don't want to look at yourself and there's a, there's a reason why a lot of people will turn off the cameras because they just can't stand what's coming through. But when you do an upgrade like this, you're always going to look good. You're going to, because you're going to look natural. So that's my recommendation on, you know, how much should you spend? Well, how uh, would you rather spend on plastic surgery or how good you look on the camera? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Junaid, you know, the plastic surgery, I could look good everywhere I go. This is, this is just limited to my home office. <laughs> well, I don't know how long we have before this vaccine really plays out. But uh, I think the other thing that's amazing about showing up virtually is this time saving. Uh, just today, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Lowe's quickly and, and check if they have this thing. Now, this place is 15 minutes away from me, right? So it took me about 15 minutes to drive out, 15 minutes to come back, and then, you know, I spent another 10 minutes. I spent 48 minutes outside. So think about meeting somebody in person. You're spending 48 minutes just trying to get to that location, whereas on a Zoom call, turn on the button, you click on the link and you're talking to them. Yeah, I think some of the some of these technology changes that we've had to be, that we've been forced to adapt to during the pandemic, some of them are going to be lasting just because people have learned that you can do business online, yeah. doing a face-to-face -face meeting 
over Zoom or Microsoft Teams. You don't have to jump on a plane to go to Japan. Exactly. I mean, of course, that face-to-face -face interaction is going to help, but maybe you don't do it as often as you did before. Mm -hmm. So I'm sold on the fact that we're on these online meetings more frequently. If you can improve your image, the quality of your image, especially right now, because I feel like you do see people that have a really good setup, but it's still in the minority. So mm -hmm. you have an ability or you have an opportunity to stand out. People yeah. say, oh, wow, you've got a, a great camera. And inevitably that reflects some level of quality or higher standard of service. Um, and I think a lot of, because everyone's doing it, whether you're a corporate executive or a solopreneur, mm -hmm. you're on these Zoom calls frequently. Like who are the people that you're working with that you have helped to improve their setups? Absolutely. So I've been talking with some real estate or loan originators that are creating content from their studios. So I was able to help them set up. So now they're able to come on video. They, they're able to record video. But the other thing that it gives you is authority. It immediately shows authority to the person watching the video. I'm like, okay, this guy is not going to talk about something that doesn't make sense because number one, they spent the time to create their image and what they want to represent. So when they speak and talk about something, it's really valuable and it's it's going to help me get to that next level. So I think authority and and then you're also, you know, you also seem authentic in one way or another. Now I think that you wrote somewhere that a home studio can help save you money. So is this a case where I have to spend to save? <laughs> yes, I think so. You're saving money by not having to drive. You're saving time by not having to get out. And the other, I mean, the biggest saving that I've found is time saving. Because I can come in my studio, I can press a hit record button and start recording on three different camera angles at the same time and talk to my audience, talk to my people, and create content on the go, and I'm out of here. The reason I created a studio for myself or why I really created a studio is I was spending too much time setting up my camera, setting up my lights, setting up all of the things. You know, it took me about an hour and a half just to set up my one scene. And when I came to talk about what I wanted to talk about in the video, I was like, wait, I don't have my scripts ready right? When you're an actor and you show up on stage, there's grip and camera people that are working on making sure that you look good. And all you got to worry about is your script, is the message that you're going to send. But if you're spending time on every single thing, setting up, you're, you're, you're wasting a lot more time. So what my recommendation is you spend the money, you set up your room, just like, you know, if Somebody comes to visit your house. You've got a dining room set up. You're not going to be like, hold on, let me pull up the table. Let me pull up these foldable chairs. Sure, that might be the case when you first moved in, right? But you have a living room set up. People can come in, sit down, have start having with the conversation. There's no setup. So that's, that's where you're spending the, the money to save time and save money in the long run. Well, I'm going to let everybody know that Junaid is on his own level because he's got multiple cameras. He's got a camera on a slider that can be behind him and like panning across as he sits at his desk working. Your lighting is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has to go to the YouTube channel to see what just happened. <laughs> but yes, I was just looking at Junaid's back with like a, I don't know, sort of like a further away shot. And now we're back to his front camera. What about lighting, Junaid? What, what should people do? Like what's the low hanging fruit or the lowest barrier that something easy that people can do to really improve lighting? Well, the number one light source in our homes that's already available 
is the windows. So anytime you have windows, make sure they're behind your computer or behind your camera and not behind your back. Because when you turn that camera on, that light's gonna distort the image and you know, it's, it, you're, gonna, you're gonna show up as a silhouette. So you wanna use that natural light source to be in front of you. So anytime you're setting up your desk, setting up your, your workstation, you wanna make sure that, that windows are behind your computer monitor or somewhere that they can, they, they can light you. A lot of YouTubers started with that. They're like, you know, I wanna create content but I don't want to spend money. I just have a smartphone, but I want to create content. Well, take that big white, big window. And if there's harsh light coming in through, just put on the curtain, just, you know, or put on the white sheet. So to diffuse that light, and that's going to create these soft shadows that you notice on, on movies and TV shows and, and sets of, of, uh, uh, talk to, talk, you know, talk show hosts and whatnot. Well, there's a lot of room for improvement here. I am sitting in front of the window. I probably need more lights because on a day like today that's overcast and as it's getting darker later in the day, my lighting is changing quickly. But I appreciate you uh, sharing with us today. I like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? I define success by having more free time. Now, what is free time where I can spend my time doing, you know, the fun stuff, hanging out with my kids or, you know, going deeper into my hobbies and being able to do that. And to find more free time, uh, you've got to have a team, right? So I've got a small team, very tiny, you know, a podcast editor and a VA that helps me produce podcasts. And I can also um, ask her to do some other things and, and you know, kind of like reaching out and whatnot. So having that team gives me that free time back. So I think that more of that is, is what I'm aiming for this year. How did you find your, t your team members? Great question. So it is said that you need to, number one, interview a ton of people and figure out what you wanted. Well, I suck at that. <laughs> so somebody had actually reached out to me about a year and a half ago. And they're like, hey, um, I'm a VA and I would love to help you, you know, promote your social media posts. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want anybody doing that, but I'll keep you in mind. So they're like, sure, no worries. And then I was like, okay, I, I do have a couple of tasks. Let me record a video. Can you do this for me? And they were like, absolutely. And then they came back in, you know, three days. And I'm like, oh, cool. I didn't have to think about that. And I built that relationship with my, with my assistant and um, with my teammate. And it was, it was mind blowing. You know, it made sense because the companies that I've worked in over the past years, you know, we are technically in a team, you know, I'm, I'm dedicated to designing the interface. I'm dedicated to designing and figuring out the color pieces where they're dedicated and developing the, the software or whatnot, what, what have you. So having a team member dedicated to one task, two tasks is what makes your company much more efficient. Plus it gives you, um, a stress-free mind to think about where you want to take the company or how you can grow uh, your practice. Is that an hourly rate that you pay somebody? I do. I do pay an hourly rate. Uh, and I don't know if there's a way, I'm sure there's ways where you can, you can hire them as an employee and right. give them a full-time wage. But I've, I've since, I'm not monetizing my podcast um, yet, yet, <laughs> right? Um, I'm keeping it at, you know, 10 hours a week. So I'm, I'm just paying for 10 hours at a week. And then they, they do the tasks that I assign them. And then they do, you know, they go work for other friends of mine. 
So that's worked out pretty good so far, but I do need to spend more time in creating more processes or more tasks oriented and create a much better management of, of how I want the company to go and, and be more efficient. You don't have to say the precise amount, but what kind of price range do you think one should be considering when outsourcing tasks like that? That's a really good point. Now, it also depends on the types of tasks. So for example, if you're looking for a video editor or looking for an audio editor, that requires a lot more concentration, a little bit more skill even. So for that amount, you know, you might spend anywhere from $10 to $15 an hour. Uh, for very minimal tasks, let's say, you know, you just need somebody to post an article or post something like that. You can go anywhere from, I think, $4 to $7 an hour. Depend Again, these people, you know, uh, the team that you're hiring are offshore. So in their uh, converted rate, you know, they are making a lot more money. But because of the currency difference, you know, we were able to um, give them an opportunity as well, right? And be price effective. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Appreciate you sharing your personal story and telling us about your hobbies and your work and giving us some tips about home studio because I think the majority of us, and it doesn't matter if we're in America or anywhere in the world, we're all really going through the same experience. So everybody is in need of a home studio. Tell the Inspired Moneymaker where to find you, follow you, and if they want to upgrade their home studio, where they can get more information from you. Absolutely. So you can check out my podcast on hacksandhobbies.com. And if you're looking to upgrade your studio, you can come visit homestudiomastery.com. Homestudiomastery.com. You're going to get me to spend more money than I want to spend. <laughs> So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? Junaid is the first beekeeper that I've ever met. He's so passionate about hobbies that he created a podcast called Hacks and Hobbies. Whether it's beekeeping, podcasting, or home studios, approach everything you do with passion. If you want to improve your home office setup for better virtual calls and meetings, I encourage you to check out homestudiomastery.com. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, please let me know by leaving a comment below. I'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Now for watching until the end, I want to send you an Inspired Money sticker or a button. Just send me your address by going to inspiredmoney.fm slash Andy. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.